and welcome to My Brain is a Wonderland Season 2. This is a podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. This is your host, Emily, and I'm so glad you're here with me today. I just wanted to give a little trigger warning. There's been a lot of trigger warnings lately, but I just want to put them out there just in case. We're going to be talking about health, health anxiety, um, hypochondriacism, hypochondriasm. Hmm, I'll check that one later. But if you have any issues with hearing about being in a hospital, at a doctor's office, being diagnosed with something, or uh, having trauma in a medical setting, uh, having surgery, anything like that, feel free to skip this episode. Let's get started. So today, I want to talk about my many health anxieties, my many issues with going to doctors and hospitals. I think really where it all begins is I don't like to go to places I've never been to or somewhere where I don't know what's going to happen. That's definitely something related to autism, might be related to ADHD, but if I don't know what's going to happen, or if I, I mean, when I go to a restaurant, I look up online all the photos of the inside, how to get there, what their menu is, when they're open, what's the experience going to be, read all the reviews. And for things like a doctor's office or a hotel, those aren't available. And when I was a child, the internet wasn't available. So that was just not a possibility. And when you're a child, what are you going to do? You're just taken to a doctor, a doctor's office or a hospital. But this always made experiences, health experiences, very difficult for me because I never knew what was going to happen. And an example would be when I was around three years old, I was in a phone booth. This is all aging me, isn't it? No internet, a phone booth. I was in a phone booth with my mom and the glass had been smashed. And it was this, you know, the glass, uh, I forget, safety glass that goes into little cubes. And I was playing with a cube of glass and it apparently went up into my finger, like under my fingernail. And my mom took me straight to the hospital because in the UK, Healthcare is free. Ta da! So it took me to the hospital, and all I remember next is I was laying on a table, kind of in the dark or dimly lit. And this was me, they were trying to get an x ray of my hand, right? Because they couldn't see the glass, and they're not going to cut open my finger to get the glass out if they don't know where it is or that it's in there. My mom basically saw me playing with this cube, and then it disappeared. So she thinks it's in my finger. And so all I remember is they're telling me, they, doctors, nurses, I don't know, are saying, put your hand on the teddy bear. So they had a teddy bear, and they're telling me to put my hand on it, and then they can take my x-ray, right? And no one's supposed to be in the room when you get an x-ray, because too many x-rays give you cancer, blah, blah, blah. And I was screaming, crying that I wouldn't put my hand on the teddy bear, because they're not explaining what's going to happen. They're just telling me to blindly put my hand on a teddy bear, and I don't know, maybe my hand's going to be cut off. This is one of my huge criticisms of uh, child health care, is that they never explain to the child, at least in my experience. They always kind of try to trick you with like, do this fluffy thing. And I'm like, I'm not an idiot, dude. What the hell are you trying to do? So I basically wouldn't put my hand on the teddy bear. And next thing I know, everyone's holding me down. So if I look back on the memory now, it feels like there were maybe eight to ten people holding me down. But if I'm a little child, maybe there were two or three. I don't know. But they were trying to hold my limbs down. And I freaked out and screamed and cried so much that they couldn't get an x-ray. And they sent my mom home with me saying, look, if it gets worse, so you find, you know, bring her back. But we can't establish anything. Turns out I later cried myself to sleep. My mom pushed on my fingernail and the glass popped out from under my fingernail. So she was right, but they just couldn't get me to do what they wanted to do because they weren't explaining anything. This happened at the dentist when I was growing up. Oh my God, this dentist I had used to drive me nuts because I would go into the dentist and I have always found the dentist absolutely horrific because you're in my face and I can't talk and I feel very paralyzed almost when I'm at the dentist. I just don't like it. And they would have a duck, like a little rubber duck in their pocket, because as they lean over you, you can see their pocket. 
and the dentist would just say, look at the ducky, look at the ducky, while they're in my mouth doing God knows what ever. And I'm thinking, you're going to pull a tooth out while you're telling me to look at the ducky or something. And I just didn't like the entire experience at all. This also runs in my family. My mom is naturally the one who would take me to the dentist. My grandmother would, because my mom just couldn't cope with going. She hated going to the dentist. So I think, I've spoken about this before, I think my mom definitely, my grandmother maybe, are neurodivergent and had these health anxieties as well that I felt probably when I was at the doctor or dentist with them. Another thing is the huge sensory issues when you go to a hospital or a doctor's office. I always had issues with the sound. There's so many people there you don't know. It's very loud. The lights are always bright, like insanely bright. And the smells, oh my god, drive me, even to this day, absolutely insane. I'm just so, I feel like I could vomit and cry all at the same time when you smell that doctor hospital smell. It's like disinfectant, but not the fun lemony disinfectant in your home. It's like the disgusting rubber glove, dead body smell or something. I just hate it. It's horrible. So I have all of these sensory issues from being autistic. Even growing up as a kid, my mom couldn't even take band-aids off me. I would scream and cry while she was slowly peeling it off, and usually I would fall asleep, like cry myself to sleep, and she'd pull the band-aid off really quickly. I mean, it was really terrible, my sensory issues. With that, I had a phobia of needles. Probably twofold. One, I didn't know what was going to happen. So the first time I ever, you know, I, I'd had vaccinations when I was too young to remember, but I had to have a blood test when I was maybe seven years old. And also the sensory issue of the pain was an issue. But when I went into the doctor's office, I screamed the place down when I got my first blood test. And my mom said, you know, we came out of that office and everyone in the waiting room thought the doctor had tried to kill me or something. And I just couldn't deal with it. And I, it's taken me years to be able to get used to having a vaccination even. And even now, it's not my favorite thing. I'm always a little bit panicky. I'm, my heart's racing a little bit. I'm a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit, uh, just not wanting to be there. It's gotten better over time because I know what to expect. But it's funny when you get different vaccinations, they feel different. I remember getting my first COVID vaccination, didn't feel a thing. I've gotten, um, a rabies vaccination. Oof, you definitely feel that. And I've had the depot um, injection, which is birth control. Didn't feel that. I think it depends a little bit on who's doing the injection as well. I had a blood test with what I think was, they said, a butterfly needle, which is a tiny needle that's splayed at the end. Didn't feel a thing. That's the only blood test I've never felt a thing on and just found it like incredible. And I always say, oh my God, you're amazing at that. I didn't feel anything. One time I had three vaccinations at once in like a Walgreens little, uh, you know, cupboard. They put you in like a tiny thing and, you know, the pharmacist comes out and gives you all the vaccinations. And I swear to God, she hit something. I don't know if it was my bone, a tendon or something, but oh, just absolutely horrible feeling. And yeah, still struggle with that to this day. One of the other things, which I think is really important to talk about, because I think for women especially, and people in general, but women especially, our pain, medical pain, and um, desires are seen as hysterical, our reactions sometimes. If we're, you know, saying our periods are killing us, if we're saying that's really hurting, I have been treated absolutely diabolically in the past, and I'm going to talk about how and why. I have had the Nexplanon, was called the Implanon, implant in my arm since I was mm, 21, maybe, maybe 20, 21, I think. And it's basically, it's an outpatient, I guess. It's not a surgery. It's basically like a little gun like they're going to pierce your ears, and it has a tube inside it that dispenses um, 
birth control for, I think at the time when I first got it, it was three years. You could put it in there. And they basically pierce your arm with it and it shoots the tube into your forearm or into your bicep. Before that, they have to give you a local anesthetic. So they have to inject you with a local anesthetic. Oh, that's one injection that hurts like freaking hell. It's like you're being sizzled to death. You're being, your arm's being fried. I hate getting local anesthetics. This would be the first time I ever had a local anesthetic when I was 21 getting this Nexplanon implanted. It's done by a nurse in the doctor's office. Really easy. It's supposed to take like five, ten minutes or whatever. So she injects me with the local anesthetic. And what they do is they touch you with the back of their scalpel, this cold metal scalpel, to kind of check if you're numb yet. And she's checking me and I'm going, no, I can feel that. And she's like, you can feel that? Are you sure? And then start saying, you know, you shouldn't be able to feel the pain, but you might be able to feel the pre Can you feel that? And so I start to panic because this um, anesthesia is not working. It's not kicking in as quick. And I can tell she's like, you can feel that? That's weird. Like, you can hear that she's thinking that. I'm panicking. I'm crying a little bit. And then she keeps touching me with it. And then all of a sudden I go... Oh, it's numb, it's numb, do it. So she puts this Nexplanon or Implanon in. I'm crying, she's panicking, checking I'm not having a panic attack or, you know, an allergic reaction to the anesthesia. And I get it in there and I'm like, okay, thank God I don't have to do this for three more years, right? Gets wrapped up, you're good in like a week, you just don't use your arm, it barely hurts after that, you're fine. So I did this every three years from the age of 21. I'm now in my late 30s. Then you have to get it removed and then replaced every three years. So every time I would go in, they would inject me with the anesthesia. It would take forever to kick in. And then I remember specifically, because they have to cut a little thing in, cut a little hole, and then pull the tube out and then put the new one in. I remember specifically saying, I can feel that. She said, no, you can't. And another time she said, it'll be over soon. So multiple times I told doctors and nurses I could feel the surgery happening. And they either told me I couldn't or, you know, wait it out, you'll be fine. So that didn't help with the health anxiety. I used to have absolute breaking down panics when I would have to get this replaced because it was every three years. It later went to four and then five years. So there was a distance between it being done. And I knew I was going to be able to feel it. And it was just absolutely horrific. Then another time I had to get my wisdom teeth out, which I'd avoided for years. But one of them started growing up under my other tooth. So I had to schedule this. And what they ended up doing is, for anxiety, they gave me these great sedatives, these pills. I mean, not Xanax, something that made you feel like you weren't even present on this planet. And I go in there, and, you know, he injects me in my mouth, in my tooth. I can't even feel it. I'm talking, and he's like, stop talking, because I was just so out of it. And he starts pulling my teeth out, and it's rock and roll. It's all good. And then I can start to feel it. I can feel pain. And I said, I can feel that. And he says, it's fine. You'll be, you know, you can, you're good. It'll be over in a minute. Again, negating what I'm telling them. I'm telling them I can feel surgery on my body and they don't care, right? So this happens, this has probably been five times, right? In getting my next plan on replaced, having my wisdom teeth out. And I'm absolutely terrified of having anesthesia because I just don't trust it and I don't trust the people giving it. So about two years ago, I had to have a congenital mole removed on my back. I didn't have to. Congenital means I was born with it, but it had been there for a long time. If I wore a bathing suit, I had to cover it. I was living in Florida. I was worried about it getting cancer. It was raised so I would catch it on my bra strap all the time. It was just driving me nuts. And this had been years in the making, you know, because I'm terrified. I don't want to do this. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to freaking do this. So I go to a dermatologist, a woman. And in the first consult, 
I break down and cry and tell her I'm afraid of doctors and she takes off her white coat and holds my hands and is very wonderful. I mean, this woman probably changed, I mean, definitely changed my life. And I thought, okay, I can, I can do this. But she said the surgery was going to be about 30 minutes long, which I've never had surgery 30 minutes long on a local anesthetic, right? Ever. And so I go in. And she gives me the injection. I'm laying on my stomach because the mole's on my back. And she gives me the injection. And she's removing it and blah, blah. And halfway through, I say, I can feel that. And what do you think she said? Not what you think she said. She said, do you have redheads in your family? And I said, yeah. And she said, you metabolize anesthesia very quickly. And she said to her assistant, a nurse or something, grab me that anesthesia real quick. And she said, I'm going to shoot you up again with anesthesia. You might feel a pinch. Because it wasn't fully worn off, right? I could just feel a bit of pain. And she shot me up again directly into the wound. And that lasted the rest of the surgery. And she said to me after, you need to be aware that you metabolize um, anesthesia very quickly. It's going to take a lot for you to feel numb, and it's going to wear off very quickly, and you need to tell your doctors that. She changed my life. Her listening to me and acknowledging what I said, I would never have known this. You know, what if they tried to put me under general anesthetic and couldn't get me under or put me under and I woke up? I mean, honestly, it's insane that no one ever mentioned this before. I had to get my next plan on out about a year after that. And, ugh, get this, the amount of advocation you have to do as a woman in healthcare is absolutely insane. I go in to have my next plan removed, and it's, you know, when you first go in, you're with the nurse, and they kind of take your vitals, check in, what do you need, da 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 And I said to the nurse, I need a huge dose of anesthesia, or you need to have a second one ready to go when I'm being having my thing removed and what had happened prior to this is because it had been in there for five years the next plan is the nurse prior had said it would be really difficult to remove because so i was kind of panicked anyway and this nurse who i said i need a second re-up i'm gonna need that she said it's just a local i said i know i metabolize anesthesia very quickly and i'm gonna be able to feel the surgery if you don't have a second tube in the room And she kind of looked at me, skew-eyed, was very skeptical, didn't believe what I was saying, which drove me nuts because I was in an OBGYN office with women, and I was just like, this is ridiculous. So she acted like she didn't believe it, left the room, and then the doctor came in. And she felt my arm and said, yeah, we can get that, you know, trying to keep me calm. And I told her, look, I'm going to need a second one, just FYI. And then that nurse, who'd been really critical, walked into the room and said, oh, here's a second set of anesthesia if you need it. So acted like I was being ridiculous and then brought it to me anyway, which I guess, thank you, but don't be an ass, you know, like you, you did it anyway. So, but I'm telling you, I had to advocate so hard for myself and mention it so many times to this nurse to get her to do that. And then what ended up happening is because the next planon was so deep in my arm with, I gained weight, so there was fat over it, muscle had kind of fused around it, it actually did take a long time. And she was saying, the doctor, can you feel that? Can you feel that? And I actually told her, no, I couldn't feel pain, but it felt almost like an itching. And I remember laying there, I was crying because I just cry when these things happen, health stuff. But I remember laying there being like, I can feel it, just freaking get it out quickly. And after pulling on it so hard, because you can feel the pull, not the pain, when you have um, anesthesia, it went pop and she just went, I got it! Like you could tell she was panicking. And we didn't have to use the second anesthesia, but immediately after she got it out and she went to put the band, like bandage on it, I was like, ow, ow, oh. And she goes, you can feel that? I said, oh my God, it hurts so bad. So immediately after she pulled it out, the anesthesia wore off. So all that to say that I understand 
if you are neurodivergent and have health anxieties, it's, I think, probably very common. And what I think you should do is really advocate for yourself and get comfortable doing that. Not just about things like, you know, anesthesia. There's lots of people out there who don't metabolize anesthesia quickly. But if you need something, like I can't stand the lights in a doctor's office. If you need the lights to be dimmed, if you need to tell them, look, I'm neurodivergent and I'm panicking, I'm gonna panic. And they kind of are like, okay, tell them again. No, I'm telling you. I am going to be really upset and panicked. I need, you know, this, that, and the other, or what have you. I, in the past, was told my husband couldn't come into the room when I was having my neck splint on removed, and I cried and because I was just so panicked about it. You need to advocate for yourself. If you need a teddy bear in the room, you know, when my husband got his LASIK surgery, he was alone, and he was like, oh, I'll be fine. And they had said to him, do you need, we have a teddy bear to comfort people that you can hug. And he told me, I was like, N he said, no, I'm good. I don't need a teddy bear. Halfway through, he goes, can I have the teddy bear? I was hugging the teddy bear so tight. So don't be afraid to advocate for what you need. Mental health, I mean, health professionals, mental health, physical health, whatever, professionals encounter all kinds of needs and things that you wouldn't imagine even. And it is their job to be there for you. So don't feel uncomfortable. Don't feel um, like you can't say anything. If you are feeling some kind of way, ask them for accommodations. One of the ho most horrible things I hate in the UK, when you go and see a doctor, you were taken straight to the doctor's room, right? So you're in the uh, waiting room and then they might weigh you in the hallway or something but right after you're taken straight to the doctor's room and the doctor has one room that you go in and you walk in the door and the doctor is sitting right there in the u.s it's totally different they weigh you inject you whatever they need to do take your blood pressure and then they walk you into an empty room and have you wait for a doctor to come in and they always sit you in these freaking horrible medical rooms with your uh, you know, medication sitting out, your needles sitting out. Like, I could just, like, stab myself. Like, it's so random. They just leave all this stuff out. Scalpels sitting out. And always on the walls are these horrible posters, right? Like, you're in the OBGYN, and there's, like, a poster of, like, vagina cancer, or testicle cancer, or just, just, just you know, horrible things. Lesions, or, like, how you could die, whatever. It's just awful. And they leave you sitting there for an unknown amount of time and just say, oh, the doctor will be with you in a minute. I've sat in those rooms for 10 minutes to an hour, just panicking, and I hate it. And I wish I'd said in the past, look, can I just sit in the lobby? And then when the doctor's ready, I'll come back in. Just advocate for yourself and know that if you are going to advocate for yourself, you might have to do it twice, three, four, ten times to get what you need. Don't be afraid to do that. You should do what you need to do for yourself. That's why they're there. That's why you're paying insurance to pay them hundreds of dollars to do this. So don't be afraid to do that. I believe in you. And with that, I'm going to end this episode about health anxieties. And um, I hope you gain some insight here about how you can protect yourself and advocate for yourself. If you are enjoying these episodes, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. And if you'd like to reach out, you can reach me on My Brain is a Wonderland pod, on Gmail, YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram. Thank you for listening. That was My Brain is a Wonderland Season 2. I'll see you next time.